Rick here with Beginner's Mind. In this episode, I talk with my buddy Chris Gleason, who's a fantastic middle school band director, about golf lessons. Chris decided that he wanted to be a beginner again and learn how to improve his golf game. So he's got some great stories, and I think that there are a lot of connections from what he learned on the golf course with what he does in his classroom and uh, just being a beginner again. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Yep. All right, Chris, great to have you on Beginner's Mind. Um, always good to talk to somebody who's learning something new and doing something different. So tell me what you've been up to. Well, I took on the challenge of learning how to play golf. Um, I started playing golf when I was younger, but never formally any training at all. And it showed. <laughs> <laughs> how so? Um, well, you know, my whole goal was to whack the ball as hard as I could. Uh, didn't really care where it went, but you know, that didn't work so well. Uh, when I go with other people, they get a little sick of, of me just trying to find the ball. So, so what decided, made you decide to, to take lessons then? Well, you know, the, I tell you, the biggest thing was, um, after doing, some study of my own on, you know, uh, the talent code and looking at brain-based learning and so on. I was kind of curious myself just to kind of go back and do something new and just experience being a learner. Um, and even trying to combat some things that I've already done wrong. Oh, um, yeah. So golf's a great about, place to, to work on that. Well, yeah. I mean, because I knew I had myelinated different passageways and I was doing things wrong. And I wanted to kind of go through that process of seeing, you know, specifically for me, like with beginner kids and even kids that have been playing for a while, it's like, how hard is it really to retrain your brain and, and to, to um, if you've learned articulation one way, to, to maybe learn it a different way and to, to, uh, to take back some of that territory in your brain. So that was kind of a chance this summer to do that a little bit and improve the game a little. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what sorts of, of things did you do in your first lesson? Were you, were you surprised at all by where, how far back you had to start? Yeah. Um, well, the first lesson was actually my son and I together and, uh, the golf instructor, uh, decided to uh, take us together, you know, for our lesson. And he stood back and, and we were on the driving range and he said, pull out your driver, which kind of surprised me because I've heard, you know, other people say, you know, let's start with putting first or mm -hmm. with irons. And and he said, pull out the driver. So we got out there and my son, and I, my son's nine and, and he hit the ball a couple of times. I hit the ball a couple of times and he looked at both of us and he said, okay, your son is fine. You need work. <laughs> so that was the first moment, you know, and I kind of knew that might happen, but, um, but, you know, for him to start that way uh, was kind of interesting. And I did ask him, I said, well, why would you approach the driver? And he said, basically it shows all the flaws. It's like very easy to find what you're doing mechanically wrong with a swing versus with a iron. Um, the, the the fundamental swing is there, but you can kind of hide some things. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to kind of just put me right at it right away and kind of see what I was doing. Um, and then uh, it didn't necessarily surprise me, but he took me all the way back to just the grip. How to oh, hold okay. on to the club. Which, you know, thinking like a teacher, I was thinking, well, yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Like, let's start with the fundamental of, the very basics, like how are you hanging on to the club? Right, um, right. It's going back on, to the embouchure. It, yeah, going back to the embouchure, and you know when, you know he diagnosed me pretty quickly. I think he figured out what I was doing. Um, he looked comfortable. He didn't look scared. <laughs> <laughs> so thinking again, like a teacher, you know, it's like that. Just that contact with the student was really important. So, you know, if a student plays something and their teacher freaks out or acts as though they have no clue what to do next, you know, it was comforting that he felt like, okay, I'm in good hands. He's seen this a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of rubbed off on me a little bit too. It's like, okay, that comfort level made a big deal to me. And um, just the way he explained it. And what I also noticed that he demonstrated a lot, 
Like he took the club, he said, you know, this is, this is the proper way and here are the different techniques and uh, here's what I would recommend. Now you do it. Mm. Uh, How many times did he have you repeat that then? I mean, was it, here's your hands. Okay. Looks good. Go. Or did he have you repeat that a bunch so you could uh, build up that, uh, that myelination? Yeah, he, uh, yeah, it was pretty fascinating. He, uh, before he asked me to change anything, he just took the club right away and said, here, you know, look at this and then notice these things. Um, and so it wasn't like he just took my grip and then fixed things. He just took it right away. And I think thinking back about that, it's just a good model just to have that good model in my brain right away, rather than trying to tweak things and use what was existing. He just kind of wiped the slate clean and said, here's what I'm looking at. Mm. Um, and then I did it. And once I did it, he did tweak a couple things a little bit. But then um, what was really cool is he told me the reason behind it. It wasn't just like, put your hands here. He said, here's why you overlap the fingers. You know, like here are two different techniques, but the overlap, he really suggested, he said, here's the reason why. So the purposefulness behind it was really important. I found that really um, inviting in a way. And also it really helped me to say, okay, it's worth doing it that way. Mm hmm so that was that was pretty interesting. That kind of rubbed off on me as well. So after you had worked through grip a little bit, how soon was it that you were swinging a club again? Did you stick with the driver or, or was it grip and then, okay, now let's go to an iron? What happened next? He kept me on the driver, actually, that whole first lesson um, for about 45 minutes. We were just on that driver. Um, meanwhile, my son is just <laughs> doing whatever he wants. <laughs> Cause he was great. Um, but he, yeah, he looked at me and then, then after that, I kind of had the grip down. Then he was, um, talking about feet and my placement to the ball. Uh, because what I was doing, what he diagnosed was, uh, that my swing itself looked pretty good. So he really didn't talk to me much about the swing. The biggest thing he had me do was my placement to the ball. Um, cause I was slicing. So okay. he had, he had a strategy for me to get behind the ball more. And what was kind of interesting about that is he said, well, here's the reason why I'm having you go behind the ball. It's not going to be your traditional placement off the left heel. He said, I actually want you to go about two feet behind the ball. And I'm like, well, that's just ridiculous. You know? <laughs> I kind of laughed at him. He goes, well, here's why, because I want you to hit the ball on the upswing. Like when the, when the club has already gone past the plane and going up, because that's going to lead to you not slicing and getting a feel for hitting that ball and striking it on the upswing. So he kind of gave me the reason behind it. Um, and then, uh, he did it for me once or twice again. And then I watched and I really struggled with that because that was way out of, out of my comfort zone. Um, so I tried it probably about three or four times. Then he stopped me. And then he broke it down for me, which again, thinking like a teacher makes a lot of sense. It's, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, doing small chunks rather than the full motion. So he got rid of my backswing and he had me just focus on that follow through going forward, just making contact. And he said, really biggest thing right now is just making better contact with the ball. Um, he even had me keep my feet close together rather than putting them apart. So, what was interesting is he took me some places that I've never, you know, when I go out and practice, that's not something I would have done, mm -hmm. you know, that he took me to a place where he said, okay, let's try this. This is going to be a new way of thinking about it. And here's the reason why. And then he had me do that probably for 15, 20 minutes then. Wow. So uh, while you were going through all this, were you able to turn off your, your teacher brain at all and, and just trust and go with it? Or did you feel um, uncomfortable at all? Like what, what is going on? This is really weird. I don't like this. What, how were you feeling during, during that? Well, I tell you, it was, uh, I think what kids probably feel a lot too, is there was frustration. Um, I trusted him. I mean, he built that trust right away. I mean, um, he was nice. He was kind. He did all the nice smile kind of thing. We made small talk before we all started. Uh, and then the trust was built right away when he looked at me and he didn't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and there was, you know, compassion. There was care. Um, there was uh, a way of him acknowledging some things that I was doing right. 
Um, and then there was a quick, you know, uh, diagnosis that kind of said, okay, here's what I'm seeing here. I got some ideas for you. Mm -hmm. So what I liked about the approach and what stuck out at me, uh, as a teacher was again, that concept of being kind and compassionate, um, to acknowledge things that are going correct, but also to be very specific with the feedback, um, not being overly, you know, throwing doggy biscuits out there in a way, being, you know, being fake, um, saying good job, good job with everything. He was just being very real. And he, he didn't say much during those 15 or 20 minutes of me practicing. He just kind of stood back. He'd offer a suggestion. Um, but he was basically watching me work through it. And I think the thing I was feeling was some frustration because I wasn't getting results. Um, it wasn't happening immediately. Go Mm -hmm. figure and I think kids feel that a lot too. It's like we ask them to play a certain way or to change their embouchure and they get mad because it isn't that microwave society where it happens right away. Right. Right. It takes time. And so I actually had to talk myself down a little bit saying, easy, <laughs> relax, <laughs> take it slow, you know. So even as an adult, someone who kind of I think understands skill building, I still had to talk myself and just say, okay. And you know, I would hit finally after, you know, 10, 15 minutes, I hit a couple of nice shots doing his method and so on. And he was very quick once that happened to say there. Mm, that's that it. Was it. That's the one. Right. That's the one. Right. Remember what that felt like. Remember that vision, you know. And then he kind of took it another step and he had me work on just one more thing after that, that kind of built on that. And he said, now that's what you're going to work on for next week. So... That was, you know, kind of the scope of of everything that happened. It was that initial diagnosis and then a a lot of kind of just showing me a little bit and then giving me one specific thing to kind of work on for that 15 minutes and then really just watching and mentoring a little bit and giving me just little verbal cues along the way. But then at the very end, he just said, okay, now here's how you're going to practice it, you know, for this next time, you know, let me see in another week. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a, a fantastic lesson. I mean, it's all the the very skillful, artful way to uh, deliver instruction and then feedback. It sounded like you were getting plenty of positive feedback when it made sense, but then also negative feedback in a way that didn't make you feel like throwing your clubs into the, the lake. <laughs> done. Um, I'm curious then, when, when you were done with that lesson, how did your how did your practice go? Were you able to do those things and and have that same success uh, in his absence? Yeah, uh, to a degree. Uh, what I found was when I went out, I started okay. Like I was immediately felt like, hey, that was that was a lot better. <laughs> but kind of slipped back into some other things again. You know, some of those bad habits again, um, and. And so that was that was a little challenging to kind of keep myself disciplined in just, you know, if I'm out there hitting a bag of balls to continue to do it the way that he said. Okay. Um, yeah. So that was, again, that was kind of a challenge. The other thing I was missing that I didn't that I wanted more of was to see myself. Like I remember seeing him. Hmm. But what I found interesting after, you know, maybe a couple of days of practice is like, I don't know what I look like. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I'd like to really see what my swing looks like. And so I gave my son my cell phone and said, here, tape me. And I actually spent quite a bit of time um, using a program called Coach's Eye, an app that allows you to slow things down and so on. But I really took a a look at my swing and I actually brought that back to him um, at my next lesson and said, here, you know, this is what I'm doing. Is that right or wrong? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and he, uh, it was great because he really, he, he used it and said, yeah, this is what I'm seeing. You know, the backswing now, when you bring it back, you bring it back too low on your plane and that's leading to you coming across the ball and he goes rather than down and through. Mm. So he explained it and then having that visual really, really helped because again, it's like, you know, like we learn with, with learners, not everyone's auditory right. and. I was using auditory. He was telling me things. I, I saw some visual, but having another visual reference really helped to cement some new concepts with me. So that really helped. So when you were looking at your self-recording 
at first before you brought it to him, um, did you feel confident that you knew what you were looking for? Or did you feel like you needed him to show you kind of what was going on? Yeah, I really felt like I needed him because um, I just couldn't figure out quite, you know, I, I didn't have a good enough um, feel for what felt right and what felt wrong because I kept slipping back into my old habits that felt right to me, but I knew was wrong because of the, the results. I mean, he kept telling me the ball will tell you everything about your swing. Oh, wow. So if the ball is pushed to the right and it curves right, he means he goes, he means you're going across the ball and you have spin on the ball, plus you're pushing it to the right. <laughs> so it's like mm -hmm. the ultimate slice. So he said, we have to square up the club face and we have to get you to, that'll make the ball go straight, but you'll still have a spin on it. So he goes, then we also have to get you to go stop going across the ball and hitting it square. And, you know, he said, basically, it's a very simple game. I mean, it's a pendulum. You just want that that club to be square and to go straight, you know, in the plane of the ball. And there you go. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a matter of getting your body to do that. But what's difficult is to perceive all those little things that are happening and to figure out what you have to tweak, you know, one little elbow movement, one wrist, you know, when to break your wrists, when to, you know, it's kind of complex. So having that visual helped me to see what right and wrong look like. Sure. Well, I mean, it sounds from what you're describing, it sounds a lot like how great teachers, uh, great music teachers approach a student where they come from the perspective of the sound and the sound tells you a lot of what you need to know about what's going on. And if I hear this in the sound, then I know we need to fix that. And it's it's more on that outcome than it is on all of the little process. Because uh, I'm sure you know, you know, you get a kid and they're on an instrument they're not familiar with, they're a novice, and you start to talk about all these fine details of coordinating the tongue and, and the embouchure and the fingers and all this. And it just doesn't work. It overloads. But you talk about make it sound like that and yeah. model and it can happen. Yeah. So, I mean, it's so interesting. Yeah, I would agree. And I think the other thing he modeled really well was giving me time. Mm. Like I think as educators, we want that result right away. And I know that as a tuba player, even starting beginning tuba players, um, you know, I want that big, full, nice, you know, sound right away. But Part of me, you know, just tells me, okay, relax. <laughs> let's focus on air. Let's get them to use air and, and get that embouchure set. But so, they just need time to kind of dwell in that space for a while rather than that push, 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 push mm -hmm. to get results. I mean, you just got to, I think we got to let them, you know, grow within that space, at least for a little while instead of pushing always. And he did a nice job with that. It's not like he, he kind of said, all right, now let's move on. He just said, all right, let's keep that going. Sure, sure. So what what are your ultimate goals with with golf? Or maybe maybe not your ultimate goals, but I mean what's your what's your next thing? Are you just looking to get a, a score or kind of where are you headed with it? Um PGA tour. PGA I, you know, tour. I'm gonna shoot oh yeah, Tiger Woods not playing so well. I think I can get him. Uh no, I think you know the biggest motivation was keeping up with my son. I mean <laughs> He's uh, he hits it straight and he's got a great swing and he's nine and I want to be able to, you know, when he um, when he goes out later on to go golfing and so on, I'd like to keep up with him. Um, I've got other family members, uh, my in-laws that play golf a lot and they're fantastic. You know, they're really, really good. So my goal is to was to improve so I could become respectable <laughs> And go out. And we did at the end of the year, um, well, year, end of the summer, we went out and played uh, a, a round of golf that we always do kind of on a family vacation. And every year I'm just embarrassed to go out there with those guys. And, you know, it's just not good. So this year after doing those lessons and so on, that was going to be kind of a benchmark for myself to just to see if I could kind of do all right. And I had my moments where, you know, it didn't go as planned, but man, they all just said, wow. You know, go give your teacher a tip because <laughs> it's remarkably better than where it was. And so, you know, I think the goal is going to be every year now just to keep going with those lessons. And and even in the winter here to, 
go to an indoor driving range and just kind of keep those skills up because as we know, if we don't keep myelinating, it's going to kind of go away. So definitely, definitely. So what have you been able to bring back to your classroom from this experience of taking these lessons? You know, I think there's a couple big takeaways that I found. One is just compassion um, because it's hard work. I mean, learning new skills, I forget the intensity it takes and that the pursuit of mastery is one that never ends. Um, but the difficulty in learning a new task, um, there's that great uh, quote by Chip and Dan Heath that's called the curse of knowledge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's that curse of knowledge. It's like, you know, it's easy for me to play a low B flat on a tuba and make it sound beautiful and so on. And I forget that for those little kids, that's a struggle at first. They're really trying to think of a lot of things. And that curse of knowledge prevents me from being patient sometimes. Um, and so I think it's important to be patient, compassionate. Um, but I think the other things I learned was good role models. Um, having those kids see the end destination, having them listen to Chris Martin <laughs> on mm. trumpet, yeah. you know, just like me watching Tiger Woods in his prime, you know, or Rory McIlroy. I mean, just really watching a good golf swing really helped me to visualize what everything looked like from the from the takeaway to the follow through and everything. Um, I think that was really important. I think as far as the teaching skill, um, going slow, chunking things, repetition, uh, quick feedback to the student, kind of like GPS style, um, when they do it right, just to give them a little nudge to say, that was it, do that again like that. Um, correction, keeping them on the path. Uh, man, I mean, I learned a ton of stuff. And I think the other one too was doing it right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Like I liked the coach when he said, let's do it wrong. Like do it your old way. And I would do it that way. And he could, and then I could see the result and he goes, now go back and now do it the right way. And just toggling back and forth a little bit, you know, and same with a kid. It's like, okay, let's play with a pinched crummy sound with no air. <laughs> <laughs> Now let's it's not hard for them to do. <laughs> right. You know, and then let's relax. And now let's fill it up. Just by kid making it black and white, they can go, oh, oh I'm yeah. leaning. Mm -hmm. I'll lean the other way and I'll try to be more relaxed and open up. And that that was a good thing to learn, too. So, Well, that's fantastic. I mean, this has been really fascinating uh, to hear about your adventures with learning golf. Um, I've pretty much gone through all the questions I have. Is there anything I missed? I don't think so. I think that's that's about my golf extent. All right. Well, I hope um, you know sometime I can get back up to Wisconsin. We can play around and we can put your golf skills up against my golf skills, which are probably about the same. I've taken a few <laughs> lessons myself, and it's the same thing: fix your grip, fix your stance. Okay, <laughs> that's right. You got it. So that's well, good. Well, thanks, Chris. I really appreciate. Uh, being on the show and, and talking with me and uh, best of luck with uh, with your next round. Sounds good, buddy. All right. Bet.